there's a way to make an entrance. This is my destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Most visitors to Darlington in northeast England see a pretty market town. But scratch the surface, and there is another, more sinister side. Pockets of hardcore unemployment and chronic alcoholism, creating an underclass without hope or future. An environment where you might expect bad things to happen. But the story of David Harker and Julie Paterson shocked everyone in the town. David Harker was living on the edges of society staggering from the off-license to the post office to cash his gyro, when one day he bumped into a woman upon whom he would play out a personal fantasy to be Britain's youngest serial killer. Harker was the nicest bloke I'd ever met at the time, the nicest person. And the first thing I noticed was his eyes, his big eyes, blue eyes. He was always the centre of attention with his bottle of white star. <laughs> In February 1995, David Harker, a would-be musician, arrived in Darlington. He'd been in and out of trouble in his hometown of Chester Lee Street, and he hoped for a new start. It wasn't long before he'd made a large group of young friends. Matt Ferry was 16 when he fell in with 23-year-old David. He used to just come round and like have his dinner and stuff like that with us, and when he got on with my mum and my sister and things, so when he said he had nowhere to stay, we just let him stay for a bit, and it just ended up being longer than we expected. Janet Ferry was 11 when she got friendly with David. When David was living at mine, he was... wasn't paying any rent or anything, but... And my mum didn't mind because he was paying us, really, in his kindness. Like, he was always doing his bit, you know, cleaning up, tidying up, helping me with my homework. He was always trying to help me because he said he didn't want me to turn out like him. Things were really looking up for David Harker when he met and fell in love with a local girl. And they moved into a flat in Harewood Grove, in one of Darlington's pretty residential areas. Harker hit it off immediately with his new neighbour, Stuart Bolton. When I first met Harker, he just came across as a nice person. You were just a nice person. He was even intelligent. Kind of in a way. He was just polite, charming. You could have a conversation with him. After a year of domestic bliss, Harker's relationship fell apart and his girlfriend moved out. He turned to the drink then a lot more. He was always sat in the park. Wherever he was, he'd have his white star, he'd have his drink. And he, he made him feel better, so he said, but he, I think it made him worse. It was at this point that Harker met Julie Paterson a woman who would change his life forever. 31-year-old Julie had a string of childhood tragedies and had recently lost her three children in a custody battle. This trauma had led her to a reliance on Valium and alcohol. I got to know Julie three years before the incident happened. Um, first as a lodger and then she became a friend. She was bubbly and she was happy. She liked to drink. But when she was depressed, you know, she went from an extrovert to an introvert. Within weeks of arriving in Darlington, Julie met Alan Taylor, with whom she was to have a three-year relationship. Alan was always a loner, always on his own. But he was a happy chap and he liked to drink and he used to do lots of work for me. And then Julie come along and well, he really he loved her. He really, really loved her. They had the ups and downs and the arguments, just like any other couple. But it was the first time he'd ever, like, been with anybody for a long time. And it was nice. We had our ways of, like, pulling out of difficult times and that's just making each other laugh. <laughs> we did. Good style. We haven't had the straightforward life. We have had some obstacles to jump over, you know. It was difficult for us both. I think she'd had a bad life. And that's why she'd uh, ended up in Darlington from Durham. From time to time, the Darlington Park drinking fraternity would up sticks to Hastings. Alan and Julie couldn't wait to move to the seaside, as it promised a new start. And then she fell pregnant. And she was pregnant with Alan's baby. 
But they took the cells off to Hastings. They were going to have a new life with a new baby, you know, and they were going to do everything differently. Um, and I don't know what happened there, but they put the baby up for adoption. I don't know if it was through choice or if it was social services choice, you know, for, for that to happen. And then they came back. I wish to God they'd never come back. Julie's circumstances were deteriorating. The adoption of her fourth child had left her depressed and withdrawn. She arrived one night. I can't remember when. It was just after they came back from Hastings, crying, cos she missed her baby. And But she, she never, ever explained why it was up for adoption. And, of course, you don't like to ask because it's, you know, it's prying into her personal life, really. And if she'd wanted me to know, she would have said. So... She was upset about it, but she thought it was for the best. But, of course, just because it's for the best doesn't make it any easier, does it? It was difficult for, for us both, actually. But I didn't show it as much as what Julie did. Julie just seemed lost. She gave up. She was upset. And when Julie got upset, she'd done silly things, you know? Um. She was depressed and she wasn't a very strong character and she would take pills if she was depressed. Throughout Julie's relationship with Alan, she regularly disappeared for days on end with no explanation. She'd go to Durham or she'd just disappear. We didn't know where she went, but she would just appear back again. Uh, dirty, hair not combed. And she'd just have a bath and a meal and a good sleep, and then she was back to normal the next day. There's been many times she'll get up, she'll say, I'm just going to the toilet, and that would be Julie disappeared. It'd be for a day, maybe it's three days. The most was a week. Confused she was. She did make herself vulnerable because she would end up being with people who were also on the streets. And, I mean, let's face it, today, who is on the streets? Drug addicts and things. So Julie was vulnerable. And if somebody's offering you a pill when you're down and you're depressed and you're crying, you'll take it. Anything. Anything to boost your morale. April the 6th, it was a Monday, and there'd been a, a clip on the telly, and it was for Coronation Street, where a young girl had been taken by this, like, religious group. Obviously getting brainwashed and she lost her bairn. And when it came on the clip, Julie said, oh, she thinks she's the only one who's lost her bairn. And that's when she went up. Oh, the whole lot went. I remember Alan coming round on the 6th of April, asking if Julie had been, had called or had seen her. And I said I hadn't. But if I did see her, I would get in touch with him. Uh, just on one of her walkabouts. Uh, he came back the next day, and I still hadn't seen her, and he hadn't seen her. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I just, like all the other times, just waited till she came back, and obviously, like, started looking when she hadn't come back. She had various appointments which she had to keep each way. One, being picking up a Valium. Two, seeing her daughter. Social Security for her counterpayments. I am there, turned up, no Julie. I really started to worry when Julie hadn't turned up for her eldest daughter's appointment, because Julie would not miss that. Although Alan couldn't find Julie anywhere, she was spotted in the pubs and parks of Darlington with a new man, David Harker. I think it was the, must have been about the beginning of April when I, when I seen them together. My mum came in and said, oh, I think Harker's got a new girlfriend. I said, oh, yeah. She looked like, she said, quite small, blonde hair. They're in the, she said, I've just seen them on Duke Street. I said, all right. And then that was in about tea time, about five o'clock, and then about seven o'clock, I went 
I was walking through here, and he was sat where I'm sat now, on this bench, and she was sat next to him, and that's when I met them. And they were, they were drunk, the pair of them, having a giggle. She was just as drunk as he was, but they were wanting more. Um, and I, I didn't have any money, so I couldn't give it to them. And just stood and chatted just about normal things, and then she gave me a hug, and Harker gave me a hug, and then I left and went to meet my friends, and that's the only time I'd ever seen her. In mid-April, I uh, last saw David Harker and Julie Pearson in uh, this Stannock Park, where we are now, on these two benches just here. Uh, Julie was virtually unconscious, drunk or whatever. Um, I was just walking through the park on my way. I can't remember if I was going out or if I was on my way home. Uh, and I came and I sat with Harker on here. And just had a chat about how things were going, how he was. Uh, that was about it, really. This all began really with um, Alan Taylor coming into, into Darlington Police Office and reporting his partner, Julie Peterson, uh, missing. He did that on the 29th of April, 1998. Uh, he said that Julie had actually been missing uh, for about three weeks before he'd come in and reported her. Um, he said that she had gone missing on previous occasions and he thought that it, this might be another time when she'd gone away just really to uh, gather her thoughts and that she would turn up uh, safely again, but he'd become increasingly worried as, as the time had uh, gone on. I was concerned that uh, here we had a, a very vulnerable person who had been missing uh, for apparently four weeks at the point when this matter was brought to my attention and no one had seen her in that time. We decided to go to the newspapers on the Thursday of that week because the inquiries that uh, had been done had, had still not uh, been able to locate Julie. So really what we wanted to do was um, publish Julie's uh, photograph because she was of a very distinctive appearance uh, with a blonde hair and being a very pretty lady. Um, we thought if we published that, someone who had seen her would, would come forward and help us with the, the inquiries that we were doing. We were asked to publish a photograph of this girl who had gone missing and had been missing for several days and nobody could explain it and I think the police were becoming quite anxious otherwise they wouldn't normally involve a newspaper in looking for you know, a woman in her thirties. As the police had hoped, Julie's photo in the newspaper jogged someone's memory and a witness called in with startling information. The witness who, who rang in said that he'd come in from work late that night, in, the early, in fact, in the early hours of the morning. And the first thing uh, that he'd seen when he went into the house was uh, a copy of the Northern Echo, which was lying on the, uh, the front doormat. Uh, and, of course, on the uh, front page of the Northern Echo was Julie's distinctive uh, picture. He recognised uh, Julie straight away as being a person that he'd seen before and immediately linked that to a conversation that he'd had with uh, David Harper. The witness told the police to look down Polham Lane, a quiet, secluded lane in Darlington. Detective Inspector Ian Phillips was sent to investigate. When I arrived at the scene, which would be 2.30 in the morning, quarter to three, um, obviously I'd been told of uh, a phone call. So by the time I'm here, uh, the lane's closed off, uh, both at the top, um, up past the football ground, down the bottom, it's all taped off. There's an officer about 50 feet in front of me. He is a dog man. And uh, on my request, some 20 minutes earlier, um, I'd asked him to search Polham Lane on the evidence that we had. Uh, so as I'm walking up here, I'm thinking, 
uh, obviously what have we got the dog has give uh, a positive indication that there's something uh, in the undergrowth he leads me to uh, an area once there i find uh, on the floor um, uh, a sack uh, it looks like a hessian sack it's three feet long and at the most um, two feet wide but to the physical eye even with torchlight it's very difficult to to see uh, what it is uh, the one noticeable thing to me uh, immediately that there was a very very uh, strong smell at that particular time the the elderly occupant of the uh, the cottage uh, came round to the front uh, asking uh, what was going on and I asked her if she knew anything about the, the, the sack that was, was lying in the undergrowth and she said to me, she says, don't worry son, uh, it's been there a couple of weeks and it's a dead dog but just, there was just something about it. Um, so I said, right, we'll wait until we get some light, some decent light because if I'm going to make a decision then and there it, it involves calling a lot of people out uh, superintendents, chief inspectors, all my, all my officers from the local division. And I just had to be certain. So I decided to wait. You, you can imagine this lane. Um, there's nothing moves. Uh, you know, by this time it's, it's three o'clock in the morning. And there's nothing, there's no traffic, there's nothing anywhere near this place. It's eerie. It is eerie. Stood out here. For half an hour, waiting of a bit of light, I don't think there was a word spoke. Uh, the first light came and within seconds, knew what I was dealing with. Um, you could clearly see uh, on the top of the sack the shoulder blades of a human being. Just put everybody uh, into very deep shock and that shock lasted for a, a few seconds before um, you gather yourself and then realize well this is a dead body it's obviously been uh, badly uh, mutilated uh, this person has been murdered butchered and we've got a job on our hands I was notified by uh, the, the detective inspector who had uh, organised the search that they thought they had found uh, the remains of a body and I went to the scene at around about 5.30 that, that morning. I can still recall my very words were, uh, gentlemen, I know you've got to go and have a look, but prepare yourselves. Uh, this is something horrible. Uh, this is something that I've never seen. It's something that you'll have never seen. And uh, I'm very sorry, but we have an awful, awful murder to deal with. In the sleepy town of Darlington, the mutilated body of a woman is discovered. Shockwaves went through Darlington. Uh, and Darlington's a decent small town, an old Quaker town, railway town. Um, it wasn't the kind of place where gruesome murders happened. Um, you know, the murders in Donington are very few and far between. This one was different. This one was um, a, a, a girl, a young woman, um, dismembered, body in a bag, in a garden of a derelict house, in a nice area of town. A local mother of four, Julie Paterson, has been missing for four weeks, and the police fear the worst. As I was driving down to attend the scene that morning, the thoughts that were running through my mind were that we'd been looking for Julie, we were all very concerned and hoping to uh, find Julie safe and well. And I was really dreading uh, the thought that uh, the, the remains that had been found um, might be Julie and that uh, she was dead and that she'd been murdered. There was a massive amount of public interest and just shock. You know, who could have done this in this town? And how could this happen? This isn't, you know, Merseyside, this isn't Tyneside. It's not inner city. 
Um, and what's going on? You know, who have we got living in here? Was he local? Could he have possibly been local? Alarmingly, more and more calls are coming in from local kids, reporting a bizarre tale of murder and mutilation that David Harker, an unemployed wannabe musician, had been telling for some weeks. However, no one had believed him. Harker used to tell us stories in funny voices about how he was going to take us down dark, secluded alleyways and kill us and that, but we used to just laugh it off, you know, I mean, think it was funny. Harker always used to call himself Devil Man. So he'd stand up on the bench and scream, I'm going to rot in hell, so is everyone else, because I am Devil Man, and that was him. He'd get his attention from saying he was Devil Man. And I used to think, I used to find it amusing, I used to laugh at him. He used to always say it again, say it again. On the afternoon of the 18th or 19th, I... Uh... I saw David Harker in Stannock Park and he boasted about how he'd chopped up Julie, dumped the body in Paulham Lane and the limbs and the head went out with the rubbish. Obviously he was drunk, so I just passed it off and didn't believe him. He told over 20 people about what he'd done. No one would believe what he'd done, uh, to the point where he was even saying, uh, I'll tell you where I've, I've left the body, or you can come back to the flat and I'll show you uh, the evidence. What um, began to emerge when we were talking to uh, the friends and associates of Harger was that they were all very much younger than he was, and that Harker had uh, been quite a, a dominant figure in that, that group of uh, people that uh, he was always out to impress them, to shock them. The police, fearing the killer would strike again, lost no time tracking down the man who by now had become their number one suspect, David Harker. Harker, at, at the time, um, was living in a bail hostel. He'd appeared at um, court earlier in that week in connection with an offensive robbery and the circumstances of that particular offence uh, were someone who had just blown, really, uh, and used extreme violence. Two officers were charged with the task of bringing Harker in for questioning. They didn't know what to expect. When we first saw David Harker, um, I mean, he, he's quite a... a, a a big guy. I mean, he was six foot three, quite well built. Um, he had very, very short, almost shaved hair, and he had uh, t two tattoos on his head. He had subhuman written on one side and disorder written on the other side of his head. Um, and just that appearance would, you know, you would look at him and think, "Whoa, he, he looks uh, like he could be a handful." There was no questions asked by himself, and he quite freely came back with us. The first two interviews that we had with David Harker, he was more than happy uh, and willing to talk to us about uh, his version of events. Um, he even went into detail that, yes, he had met a girl. Uh, he denied that her name was Julie, and he gave her the name Roxanne. We allowed him to tell us his version of events. And in that scenario, he was very comfortable in talking to us. It was only until the uh, end of the second interview, I believe it was, where he became a little bit agitated and worried. And then he started complaining that he heard voices in his head, and these voices were telling him what to do. Whilst Harker's interviews continued, a team of police officers and forensic scientists were investigating his flat. Number 6A, Harewood Grove. I remember going into the backyard there. The mood of the of the team was one of trepidation, really. I think that was probably the best way to describe. We really didn't know what we were going to find when we opened the door. My worst fears were confirmed as soon as we opened the door. 
and we saw what appeared to be this, the trail of blood leading from a cupboard underneath the stairs. That was consistent with a body being dragged from the cupboard out and along the, along the passageway to the room at the end of the, the passageway, which was um, a cellar-type room and had shuttered windows and really was quite eerie and macabre when we went into that room. We found items of clothing uh, which seemed to correspond uh, to items that um, Julie had been wearing. There was a pair of uh, tracksuit bottoms there, I, I remember. What we found was, in most of the rooms, was either property belonging to Julie or evidence that Julie had been there. We went into the kitchen of the, of the house. And on a shelf in the kitchen were a pair of uh, training shoes that later, it turned out, were Julie's. When we later went into Harker's bedroom, there was heavy blood staining in the corner of the bedroom. Scientists later told us that that was consistent with a part of Julie's body having been in that corner and blood having soaked through the carpet into the floorboards below. There were a number of what appeared to us initially to be poems. We didn't know the significance of some of those words, but they appeared to us to be very significant. Also on the wall there was one word which was becoming, which also was written on a knife that we later found in the garage uh, of the house, where we found a bloodstained blanket um, in, in a plastic sack. I can remember a feeling of uh, sadness, really. Uh, I think I regarded it as almost inevitable that this is where um, the murder had taken place. Um, I, and I knew that the circumstances for, for Julie must have been um, frightening. The police charged Harker with Julie's murder and he was summoned to court. When I knew that there was only the, the torso of the body that was found, that I really just couldn't believe it. Um, it couldn't be Julie. Um, not to have arms, legs and a head, it just, you know, it just couldn't be Julie. I was violently sick. In fact, I think we all were. Um, it was just a horrendous thing. When the police came round and uh, I actually found out what had happened, I was completely shocked that he'd actually done it and I was disgusted that he did it. Uh, I just didn't know really what to think at first. It took a while to sink in. I was uh, obviously felt for her family, uh, felt for him for being such a bloody idiot. Uh, thought he shouldn't have done it, and then basically all I could do was help the police and get him locked up, really. Didn't want him walking around the streets, didn't want him doing it again. Despite having boasted endlessly to his friends about the murder and mutilation of Julie, Harker now vehemently denied any knowledge of it. He refused to reveal to the police where the missing parts of Julie's body were. Durham Constabulary now launched the biggest inquiry they'd ever carried out in a desperate attempt to find the rest of Julie's remains. This was a challenge. This was uh, us versus uh, Mr Harker. Right. We wanted to find those parts. We wanted to find them for the family's sake and to give Julie some respect as well. The police had to start their search somewhere. The only leads they had were the often contradictory boasts Harker had made to his friends. 
he told people he put the head uh, down a drain. He told other people he'd thrown uh, the rest of the body in the river. He told other people that he'd disposed of the arms and the legs uh, by putting it out in domestic waste. We were publishing stories uh, in the days following that, asking people to check their bins, to check their gardens, their outhouses. Uh, really pretty gruesome stuff. We searched around the find, and we, we, we took the search out to a mile, and we searched all the parklands, we searched the ponds, uh, we did the drains, we had cameras down drains, and we were actually looking down all the sewage systems. We must have had stories almost every day about how the search was going on. Um, they, they were looking all over South Park, uh, they were looking in the river uh, th that, that flows through Darlington. Um, a very visible search, uh, a, a very public search, and they were involving the public in it. Um, and then I think really the most macabre twist came when the police said, well, we, we've not found anything uh, in the town. Um, we have to search the rubbish tip. A 50-strong team of police officers were dispatched to the local rubbish tip, Coxo Tip, one of the largest landfill sites in Europe. It's quite awesome to, to drive into this uh, massive hole in the ground. And basically, in the distance, I could see the two police carriers, right? and there were specks in the distance. And you could hardly make out the officers because of the the enormous size of this, this huge hole in the ground. Despite the overwhelming size of the task, the police team searched around the clock. To open a bag and you know it's Darlington because it's got a Darlington address on an envelope and the house is maybe two streets away from the murder scene. And in that same bag, you find a newspaper dated 17th, 18th, 19th of April. If anybody found that, it was like, this is it, this is it. Come on, we're in the right. We know this is the refuse being collected from that area on those specific dates. Over the three week search, the police sifted 20,000 tons of rubbish. But despite their best efforts, the whereabouts of Julie's body parts remained a mystery, and the search had to be abandoned. Defeated? I don't think we were defeated. It's just, we just couldn't find them. We just could not find those parts. And I still believe, I still believe uh, to this day that uh, certainly parts of, of Julie uh, around that uh, landfill site. I firmly believe that. On July the 24th, Julie was finally buried. Well, because Julie's parts haven't been found, the funeral was a funeral, but with a big difference. There wasn't enough of her for the, you know, to be a burial, to be a funeral. She'll never be at rest. None of us will be at rest until they find all the other parts, put them together and bury her properly. That's when she'll be at rest. Julie's gruesome murder had the small community of Darlington in shock. David Harker was still refusing to admit to the crime, despite the overwhelming forensic evidence linking him to Julie's murder. Neither would he reveal the whereabouts of Julie's head, arms and legs. Some weeks into the inquiry, uh, Harker's solicitor had applied for him to be uh, assessed psychiatrically, and Harker was transferred from prison to Ashworth Hospital for that assessment. Almost uh, immediately, he began to repeat the stories that he had told to his friends and associates. Prior to his arrest, Harker had boasted to over 20 friends about his ambitions to be a serial killer. 
and told of how he had killed his first victim, Julie Peterson. Harker seemed desperate to uh, tell his story and wanted to be known as the youngest uh, serial killer uh, in Britain. The personality disorder that was applied in this case was that of the antisocial type, or otherwise known as the psychopath. The offenders are sane in the sense that they, um, they, 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 they're perfectly rational. On the other hand, they have been described as morally insane. They have this blind spot. They are unable to see right from wrong. So this means that they can carry out really vicious, nasty acts. And he, he will have spent many hours every day dreaming about the horrific things that he could do. This is all part of the syndrome he was evidently suffering from. And included in this, of course, is, is the wish to be famous, to go down in history as, as one of these notorious offenders. During his time at Ashworth Psychiatric Unit, Harker claimed to have killed two other people, but the police found no evidence to substantiate this. Harker continued to make outrageous allegations about Julie's murder. He told psychiatrists that after he'd killed Julie, he'd cut off a part of her thigh and cooked it with garlic butter and pasta. Silence the lambs and things like that, it was always. I could be in that, but as devil man, I'd do a better job, I'd be devil man. Just everything he was, he was devil man. If he could murder somebody, he could eat somebody. The, the fact that somebody so close to me could murder somebody and eat flesh, whatever, it's, it makes me feel sick. It'd be the same as if my real brother did it. Harker's claims made front page news and he seemed to have achieved his goal of becoming a famous cannibal killer, like his hero, the American cannibal killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. He even tried to imitate them. As well as keeping body parts in his bedroom, the police were horrified to find Julie's training shoes on his kitchen shelf. I think uh, a particularly upsetting part uh, of this case was that Harker had claimed that he'd actually uh, eaten part of uh, Julie's body. Uh, there has never been uh, any evidence to confirm that that was the case. It is only Harker's claim. And again, our feeling was that he was making that claim in order to try and sensationalise uh, what he'd done. David Harker fitted in the category of offenders who find it very difficult to distinguish reality from fantasy. They are imagining themselves as notorious or famous, as they would put it, killers. So they build up this fantasy life of, of great acts that they have done. And so when being questioned by the police, they will bring out all these fantasies, not making a clear-cut distinction between what is true and what is pure fantasy, which makes them very difficult to assess. Harker didn't stop at cannibalism. He also tried to convince staff at Ashworth that he'd indulged in necrophilia and that he was creating a mask out of the skin of his victims. Again, no evidence of this was ever found and police began to suspect that he was fueling his fantasies from the plots of well-known films. What we're talking about here it is a coming together of two different disorders. There's a sexual disorder, the fascination with, with, with torture and killing. And on the other hand, there's the, the desire to shock other people. And this is part of the psychopathic disorder. They want to make an impact on other people. So, so in this, this case, it's together of, of these two different features. He seemed to be desperate uh, to, uh, you know, to somehow impress people uh, with, with what he was saying. Um, and at the time, I know that uh, he was trying to uh, contact newspapers and try and convince them that they should write uh, a book about him. Whilst Harker was at Ashworth, he started a letter-writing campaign with the Northern Echo newspaper. I think what's interesting in the letters is that um, 
Harker has portrayed himself as the victim. Um, he doesn't talk about Julie Peterson at all. Harker makes outrageous allegations in his letters about his parents, all of which are untrue. From the age of two years until I was 16 or so, I was beaten on a regular basis by my father, sometimes for no reason other than that he was high. At the age of six, I first attempted suicide at school by trying to hang myself on a skipping rope. At the age of 10, I was forced to watch a dogfight my father held at home, then to clean blood and flesh afterwards. But because I used the wrong type of cloth to do it, I was beaten. The person with the uh, psychopathic disorder will, will, will feel very strongly that they have been treated badly because they are basically very selfish. They will, they, will, they will highlight all the injustices that have been done to them throughout their life. So, that, so they will be able to describe the various um, beatings and things they've had as, as children. My mother was disabled. I was forced to do housework to her specifications, and if not, she told lies to my father, who would then resolve it with a beating. So often in cases of this time, they describe a disturbed childhood. Now, this could simply mean that they were awkward children because the characteristics of the psychopath are apparent as a conduct disorder very early in life. So this makes them very difficult to manage at school and at home. When I was 16 is when it all began. But you don't want to know why I'm becoming because I don't shout it out plainly. If you have a friend at the police, ask them what was written on my bedroom wall when they searched it. Harker committed his first documented offence at 16. He was charged with two offences of assault, one of damage and one of cruelty to an animal when he kicked a dog to death. Harker clearly thought that he had the right to take another uh, human being's life and that he was superior to other people, and that by taking the person's life, that somehow he would become more powerful. He was always saying, I'm born again with snake's eyes, becoming God's eyes. And I asked him where he got it from, and apparently it's from this song, Becoming, that Pantera song. The whole time he was saying it, before the murder, he was always saying, I didn't understand. I just thought it was just a song that he liked. And now, when I think about it, he wants, he wants to be famous, he wants to be better than everyone, almighty, better than God, so that's probably what it means. He was a rather typical example of the psychopath who is also a sadistic killer. He, he fitted the various criteria going back to his early life, the nasty things he did as a child, the, the, the kicking a dog to death, for example. These are all the features of the psychopath and someone who gets pleasure from torture and killing. In Harker's fifth and final letter to the Northern Echo, he wrote, I'm not evil, but I am a monster. The detectives that questioned me were too stupid to realise what I was. He wanted us to think of him as a good guy. He wanted people to believe that Julie was trash. He wanted to be known as a monster. He, he wanted to be kind of a good monster. He would not accept that he was absolutely terrifying, despicable killer. As well as the letters, Harker sent the Northern Echo a riddle, hinting at where Julie's body parts might be. You never told me if you liked riddles, but I'll tell you one anyway. The title for the riddle is Churchill. I own a bank, but have no money. I have falls, but keep going. I have a mouth, but do not eat. I have a bed, but do not sleep. I have a beginning, but have no end. What am I? Do you know where it is? This case reflects the, the problem we have o over what is evil, what is bad, and what is mad or insane. It's um, standard procedure to, to carry out brain scans, 
EEGs for brain waves to try to find out if there is something abnormal in the brain which can help to explain or help to arrive at a diagnosis. In this case, it was somewhat unusual in that nothing um, came out from these tests. The psychiatrists who examined Harker agreed that although he was in full control of his actions when he murdered Julie, his total lack of remorse showed an absence of conscience, which put him in the top 4% of psychopaths in Britain. In sentencing him to life, the judge said that Harker had killed Julie Paterson in the most terrible circumstances and that he had glorified in her death and in the manner of her death. He said that he had shown no remorse and that given the slightest opportunity, he was sure that Harker would kill again. When the life sentence was passed on Harker, uh, there was obviously uh, a big release uh, of emotion uh, in the people who were gathered uh, in the court. Um, I think people were relieved that that brought that part of the, the case to an end. But I feel we don't feel very well, they still, it's terrible. And I can't wait, he's not saying what he's done with the rest of my daughter's remains for a start. That's what I, that's the main thing we want in it, Michael. Yeah. Remains to be found. If Harker had any, any decency within him, and bear in mind we are now two and a half years since uh, this uh, horrible incident, if he had anything in him, he would have let somebody know. He wanted people to, to guess, to try to guess where things were. But he still kept, kept dropping in the odd little bit of a tease, like, you know, somebody might find the head someday. And, you know, I, I still think he probably might still hope that somebody might discover, you know, parts of our body that have never been found. Uh, and, it, and it's pretty frightening to think that actually, he, you know, he may have put them somewhere where they could still be discovered. David Harker is currently held at Wakefield Prison, serving a life sentence. <laughs>